Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 201 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Greg Crabtree about money. Money. Today's podcast is brought to you by LawPay, Smokeball, New Law Business Model, and Back Office Betties. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support, so stay tuned, and we'll tell you more about them later on. And now I'd like to introduce a new occasional segment I'm calling, Hey, Aaron, what are you reading? Hey, Aaron, what are you reading? <laughs> What, what I hate about this new occasional segment <laughs> is that, like, my answer is complicated. Okay. How so? Because I am simultaneously in the middle of multiple print books, multiple Kindle books, and multiple audio books. Hence the reason we are doing this segment, because Aaron is a voracious consumer of books of all kinds. So I'll just kind of start ticking them off. Yeah, well, or, you know, the ones that are worth mentioning. I suppose if this is an occasional segment, maybe I should hold back yeah, we'll so get that to I have it. stuff we'll get to, to talk about another yeah. time. <laughs> uh, on the print side, I just finished Ray Dalio's book, Principles, okay. which is both his lifelong, life-learned lessons of how he wants to live his life and how to run his business. Ray Dalio is the founder and chairman of the largest hedge fund in the world. He's like a billionaire multiple times over. It's a fascinating book. He's a very reflective, thoughtful person with some very interesting ideas. Some so you, of which you and I have be... talked about how many business books, there's basically a nugget that you can skim for. So is this a skim for the nugget or is this a No, this is book? like 500 pages of dense, crafted stuff, each sentence of which has been developed over gotcha. years. Yeah. Okay. It's the opposite of a skimmable business book. Okay. And then probably against the rules, I'm only just now in the middle of Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets, despite yeah. the fact that it was a lawyer's Last book, club book, club. book yeah. and she was on our podcast a while ago. But <laughs> because of my long book queue, I'm only now actually just reading it. And it's awesome. I also recommend it. On my Kindle, I just finished <laughs> Sherry Walling's Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Shit Together. And Sherry will be on our podcast in a few weeks. And you can look forward to that. She is a psychologist specializing in the brains of entrepreneurs and the relationships that entrepreneurs have. And so she's got a book on how entrepreneurs specifically can manage their mental health and the relationships people have with entrepreneurs. Gotcha. Um, wow. so that's a good one. It's short, easy, but full of really good takeaways on how to have a better brain as an entrepreneur. Is that a skim book or a um, read it's, deeply? It's a short paperback, but it's worth reading. Um, she's put a lot of care into making sure that the content in it is useful. Um, and then I just yesterday started on my Kindle AI Superpowers by Kai-Fu Lee, which is uh, about the future of artificial intelligence and mostly specifically about his thesis that China, not the United States, is most likely to lead the AI revolution and what that means for all of us as humans on this planet. It seems likely now that there's like a mad scientist in China who's editing genes and things. So I might recommend that to anyone curious about what the world is going to look like right before it's destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the first evil genius is right now constructing their lair in a dormant volcano as well. So yes. that's the world Semi related. <laughs> Yesterday on Audible, I just finished Alibaba, the book about Jack Ma and Alibaba. So apparently I'm oh, cool. on something of a like Chinese tech startup binge yeah. this week. Which um, of these would you most recommend to somebody who wants to pick up a book now and get something valuable? I mean, it depends out of it what you're business. interested in. Uh, I mean, we featured Annie Duke on the podcast and the book club for a reason because her kind of methods for strategic thinking, I think, are really important for lawyers running their businesses. Um, and we will be featuring Sherry Walling on the podcast in a couple of weeks because we care a lot about lawyer and entrepreneur mental health. So I think those are probably mm -hmm. the most 
tangibly useful. If you go deep on the personal development business strategy stuff, I think Ray Dalio's book can have a lot of really interesting things to think about whether you implement any of them or not. And then I always try to spend lots of time thinking about the future. So those books are useful there. Cool. And then on a totally different note, I'm currently on Audible listening to Andre Agassi's autobiography, Open, even though I have never cared even a little <laughs> bit about tennis or Andre Agassi. I don't think I've ever even watched a tennis match in my life, but, are you but it's a it? fascinating yeah. book. Yeah. Cool. So there you go. That's yeah. what Aaron's reading right now. That's awesome. The, uh, the reason it's what is Aaron reading rather than what is Sam reading is because I just wait for Aaron to sort of curate good business books for me. Uh, and then he hands them off and I read fewer <laughs> as a result. Yes, I can filter <laughs> out the, the needless ones for you. That's very cool. Thanks, Aaron. Anytime. We'll return to this occasionally um, with our new segment called, Hey, Aaron, what are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> And now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Emily LaRouche from Back Office Betty's. And then we'll talk about money with Greg Crabtree. I'm Emily LaRouche, CEO and founder of Back Office Betty's. Back Office Betty's is a virtual receptionist company that is serving solo and small attorneys across the U.S. and Canada. Hi, Emily. Thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure. So we wanted to talk about niches or niches. I can't decide how I want to pronounce that word. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> back office Betty's at one point was a general virtual receptionist service. And at some point you decided to focus on law. And I'd like to ask you more about that process of getting into a niche. Like why do it? What are the advantages to going into a niche over being a general service company? Well, after a couple of years in business, it became increasingly difficult to be an expert. As we kept adding industries, I kept challenging myself, how are we going to be an expert at all these different industries? So I sat down with my team and I said, you know what? We can be a pretty good answering service for all of these people, or we can be an amazing virtual receptionist service serving one client. So we have a kind of a litmus test that we do for our company decisions. And we'll ask, is it good for the company? Is it good for the client? Is it good for the team? And a lot of us already had a legal background. We love serving the attorneys. So it was like, yes, 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 hands down, attorneys all the way. So we just, you know, put the brakes on and made a huge pivot. I think that sounds really analogous to me to small firms where it's hard to be a generalist and just dig into a little bit of everything. And that's why many firms end up going with a niche and having a personal injury practice or an estate planning practice or something like that. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And the firms that we answer for that are really niche and, you know, they're not just like Smith Law. They would be something like tenant law or family law. I feel like they have a lot more success because it's really easy to understand who their client is and are they a good fit for you? It sounds like the brand messaging and narrowing that message and targeting it better is a piece of it as well. Absolutely. And I kind of look at it like you're standing on Times Square and you yell out, hey, you, you're going to get a bunch of heads turning. But if you're only looking for Ted, although in New York City, probably nobody will turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe nobody <laughs> will give you the yeah. finger. But if you yell out, you know, hey, Ted, chances are Ted's going to turn around. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like really narrowing out who do you want to serve? And we came down and even, you know, gave ours a name and created an avatar. I can't even remember what the name was. It's been a few <laughs> years, but we made a whole persona of who do we love? Who do we want to serve? And we based it off of one of our favorite clients. You also mentioned to me before we hit record the 770 rule. What is that and where does it come from? This one I heard from Vern Harnish. He's the founder of Entrepreneurs Organization. And he's talking about, you know, find 7% of a market to focus on. So for us, we really focus on solo or small firms. Maybe for an attorney, it might just be contracts. But you find 7% of that market and then you dominate it with 70% market share. Hmm. The idea there being that you're going to try and find a small section of a big market and then just really be the winner in that market. Absolutely. And the way Vern explains it is, you know, on a scale of one to five, what can I do at a level 10? Who can I service at that high level? And then that's the niche or niche that you're going to focus on and really just dominate it and do exceptionally well. So I always ask, you know, how can we make our clients lives better? What can we do to outserve them? Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes a ton of sense, right? Find what you can be best at and then be the best at it for the most people you can practically be the best for. Yep. And, you know, as a solo attorney, I mean, I could say that I, I feel your fear when you have to turn away that first client because you, you know, you declare your niche and you say, this is what I'm doing. And then you get someone who asks for something else. It's terrifying, but 
I can tell you I've come out on the other side and it is so worth it. One of my favorite blog post titles on Lawyerist uh, was written by Randall Ryder. The title was, The Bad Clients You Don't Take Will Be the Best Money You Never Made. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best. I yeah. love it. <laughs> well, thanks for being with us today. And Back Office Betty's has a free giveaway for listeners at backofficebetty's.com slash lawyerist. And it's a set of tips for automation within your law practice. Um, so go to backofficebetty's.com.lawyerist to find that guide to law practice automation. Emily, thanks so much for being with us today. It's been fun. I'm Greg Crabtree, CEO of Crabtree Owen Berger. We're a CPA firm that focuses primarily on helping entrepreneurs run a profitable business to build wealth and uh, build it both in terms of value and profit creation so that they can uh, make an impact on society and for the people that they serve. Hi, Greg. Thanks for being with us today. And so you wrote the book, Straight Numbers, Simple Talk, Big Profits, Four Keys to Unlock Your Business Potential, which it's worth mentioning if you're listening to this podcast in the month or the week in which it goes live, this is our book club pick for the Lawyerist Insider Facebook group. So, and Greg, I think you're going to join us for a workshop as well. Yes. Yeah. So looking forward to it. Appreciate you having me. So reading your book, um, I have the impression that you are the rare CPA who can look beyond, you know, the tax burden. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of one of those things that it took me a while to kind of get my head formulated around it. I, I was fortunate enough to join a group called the Entrepreneurs Organization. Right. And, and it's a, a place with entrepreneurs kind of hang out and forum. There's various groups that do that. But the nice thing was, is I had in my monthly forum meeting, uh, I had nine other people that by forum rule I couldn't do business with. Mm. And they were the perfect profile of who I wanted to do business with. And hmm. and so it was really kind of one of those things where I got to apply a principle that I now tell in my talks when I do them. I said, you know, you know, running a successful business takes three things. I need to figure out what the market needs. I need to find a way to do it profitably. And then I need to tell everybody about it. Mm hmm. And, and that kernel of thought started with that forum because I got a chance to truly figure out what the market needed rather than trying to sell it what I was doing. Uh, wh and what's your perception of what the market needed? Well, it was really fascinating. They told me three things. Uh, the first thing they told me was, hey, we don't like the April 15th surprise. Right. Uh, and I said, <laughs> you know, I said, hey, oh, by the way, accountants don't like that either. But there's a I do have a process that I know how to fix that. So I can appreciate that. So I said, what else? And he says, well, we don't like being billed by the hour because mm -hmm. it's a barrier. You feel a hesitancy to call and ask for, uh, you know, get a question answered. And I said, interestingly enough, I don't like billing by the hour or being billed by the hour myself. And, and really, uh, you know, in terms of your audience being attorneys, I will, I will hypothesize this. I have learned the fact that from an hourly billing methodology, there's only two economic outcomes. I either charge for my ignorance or I gave away my expertise. <laughs> that, that's, I like that. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. And so now the challenge is, is I got to have a technique that mm -hmm. allows me to bill on a fixed price basis. And so what it forces you to do is to productize your service and you start creating components of your service. And then as we say it now, our, our simple numbers is really a platform. Mm -hmm. So simple numbers is our platform of how we run everything. And once you're on that platform, we can solve a, a whole different host of problems and challenges that our clients face. But if you don't want to be on that platform, I'm just giving you random guidance in terms of you know, anecdotal evidence that may not be authoritative. Well, and the platform is, I think the big picture is kind of like, let's change the lens uh -huh. from thinking about your, your business solely in terms of the end of the year tax burden yeah. and, and change that to like, to work backwards from profits. Like th that, that is the core reason for your business to exist. So let's use that to do our math. Absolutely. And, and really, you know, uh, it, it, it establishes this framework of various plays that you're going to run. So I'll, I'll touch on those in a moment. But at the end of the day, you know, I said, okay, well, I understand that. It says, what else? And it says, and this was, this was the damning indictment of a profession. And I said, oh, by the way, 
You see hundreds of businesses' most intimate details, more so than any person, bankers, attorneys, whatever, mm -hmm. as an accountant. I see more true raw data than anybody as a, as a provider. And since you got to have some idea what works and what doesn't. And that was the illuminating moment that I realized that here we're thinking we're doing tax returns and payroll taxes and bookkeeping and financial statements and whatever else. And I have data going in front of my face that the Federal Reserve economists would kill for. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> because in today's economy, I, I and, and I don't know this authoritative number, but I, I, I think I, I the last number I heard that you know seventy percent of GDP in the U.S. is comes from privately held businesses. Right. And guess what? The federal and I've talked to Federal Reserve economists before uh, in in my travels, and they have no insight to our data. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are taking statistical models and applying what they think the economy is doing. And, and really, they largely rely on public company data and then make extrapolations into the private sector, which they're totally blind to. Mm -hmm. Whereas I sit here every day, every day, myself and my consultants, you know, we talk to clients all over the U.S., Canada. We got some international clients as well. But you know, really, we've started modeling that data. And so I've done multiple modeling projects over the years of where I'll take a group of client data and study it. And that was that critical piece, because once I was motivated to do that first study, that led to the first book. And there's mm -hmm. critical elements of things we learned by studying the data. And I was studying it because nobody was paying me to do it. I was studying out of the pure <laughs> interest of what is truth. This is the best reason to look for things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm trying to find what what is financial truth in this mm -hmm process. And, uh, and I think we've, you know, when we've continued to even, I mean, I, I'm reticent to, to, to say that I've not written simple numbers 2.0. I'm in the process of doing it, but mm -hmm. I think it'll be groundbreaking from what we've learned since the original book oh, cool. uh, that uh, you know, I'll tease everybody with that coming out. As but it'll as be I a can. while. There's no reason not to buy the current book. There's not. not a, yeah. Because <laughs> that, that, well, there's things that's the core. I mean, the, the current book, the original book is the core of the philosophy of you know right. the, the foundational elements of how you run a run a business profitably. But well, maybe we can start by previewing those. Like you, you talk about the four keys, and so right. in yeah. in brief, what are those four keys? Well, the first thing is is you've got to remove distortion. So I said I, we are purveyors of financial truth. I'm willing to break any rule of general accepted accounting principles to actually create financial truth. And and this came from not from studying academic accounting. It came from studying entrepreneurs and figuring out, getting inside their head, which can be a dark place. But, you know, you get inside their head and you go, hey, what are you looking at to run this successful business? Because I wasn't helping them run a successful business. They already had one. But in my curiosity, I started really focusing on these guys that were really good. And they, they're in the traditional sense, their data was horrible. Mm -hmm. And so I kept looking at it. And there, there really were these elements of, of truth that they looked at. And, you know, really it was built around things of, of they understood cash flow. They understood what they were going to intentionally use profitability for. They understood, you know, capital improvements, but not in a technical way that an accountant would appreciate, hmm. you know, but they, they just knew how to make it work. And so I kept studying that. And I said, okay, let me see if I can create a framework of understanding. But the first thing was, though, is also had to look at there's also motivations by an entrepreneur to distort the truth based on their emotions. <laughs> uh, and, and so, and, and there's tax motivations that cause some of this distortion. And, and so when I did my first data aggregation project for the book, I realized that I had to come up with a way to aggregate data to study it, even though I was using a bunch of different businesses from different industries. And then as I kept solving each problem, those really kind of became the foundation of our simple numbers approach to, to business. And it started with, first and foremost, we had to normalize owner compensation mm -hmm. because – I mean, the owner compensation is the biggest distorted factor of a privately held business that's under $10 And what you mean by that is many, many owners are not paying themselves a salary yeah. that is a reasonable salary for the actual position they have. Yeah, and, and the way you say that is you get paid a salary for what you do, you get a return on what you own, don't confuse the two. Right. 
because I can own a business and not do the work. I can do the work and not own it. And, and so those are two totally dis disconnected activities that if you don't isolate them in their pureness of, of responsibility, you actually start mixing stuff together and you don't really know you know, how, how is it that, that I'm not being successful here? So I want to talk more about that, but before we get to it, I want to make sure we get out the, the four keys. And so once we, once we fix that piece, there's only one other primary distorted factor would be uh, owner-occupied real estate. So if you own the building that you're mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. your business out of and you're not charging yourself a fair market rent, you could either be high or low, neither one of them is good. And there's really not a good motivation to do it other than, you know, people just like to make themselves feel better about it you know so so really the idea is hey just charge the right number because if you ever stop renting from yourself the building needs to have a rent that's market that it can stand on its own and the bill your business might need to move elsewhere you know in that process right so we can evaluate the business on its own standards at that point so first key is making sure that your expenses looks right right exactly the second element is you must establish a target of profitability. You must have an expectation. Now, this is where I, I will give you a preview of the material to come because this is not in the original book. Mm. In the original book, I gave a hypothesis, you know, and this was just from observation, that 10% was break even and profitability, 15% was a great business, anything above 15%, take it while you can get it or the market will compete you back you know, mm -hmm. to that point eventually. And that actually works primarily for most service-based businesses. And you know, I'd say 70% of the businesses are easily still going to fall in that number. I just now know why I set that number. I set it originally, like I said, just from pure observation. Because if you get down to 5% profitability in those types of businesses, the problem is if you have any debt, all of your cash flow is being sucked up by the debt service. And so actually you can have 5% profit and still be negative on a cash flow basis. So 5% is effectively break even. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or and, worse. And, yeah. Right. Or worse. Yeah. And, and depending on how, how the debt load is. So I always, you know, 10% was kind of a good target to say, hey, I feel pretty good that most of us don't have so much debt service that at 10% profitability, we're going to be okay to, you know, to meet debt coverage ratios from the bank mm -hmm. and those kind of things. And what we can shoot, we can build cash and then try to decide what to do with it. And, and, and as we say, you know, the reason why you have to set a target is a man who aims at nothing hits it with amazing accuracy. You know, right. so, so you must establish an expectation. Now, here's, the, here's what we've learned since. Actually, you set your target based on what we now call return on invested capital. So what is universal to all businesses is a viable business model for a long to, to, to cover on today's podcast. But the idea is once I establish my capital invested that I need to have to cover how much buffer cash do I need to have, how much trade capital do I need to have for res cover receivables, inventory, you know, most of your audience, obviously they're going to have receivables, but also do I get vendor support? And, and in, in mm -hmm. your industry's case, you don't get it. So you have, you're mainly carrying receivables and work in progress is the thing you got to fund. You have a little bit of an equipment, which we call infrastructure capital. You sum all that up and say, if I'm going to run a million dollar practice, how much do I need? How much invested capital will I need to have? And it's probably about a hundred to hundred fifty thousand, probably uh, at, at minimum, maybe two hundred thousand. And when you when you say that, do you mean money in the bank, or what do you mean by invested invested capital? Invested capital is the sum of all assets minus the sum of all liabilities, and so cash plus the things I bought and own in the business minus. Do I get any support from vendors, which probably in your business you don't? I see. Okay. And and it doesn't count debt on the liability side. You're counting what what do I actually need to invest in? And so interestingly enough, so what for, we, for most lawyers, it's going to be mostly cash, right? You're not going to own a whole lot of assets beyond the laptops in the office. Well, so three things: cash, accounts receivable, and work in progress. Oh, right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so you're you know, for a million dollar practice you could easily be two hundred to to three hundred thousand potentially yep. that if, makes sense. if you're not good at billing in advance or, or getting money up front <laughs> or those kind of things. You and can change that number by just doing the bills. <laughs> uh, that's right. That, and and you certainly and if once you understand that from a technical standpoint, you actually have a little more courage to actually go ask for it. Mm -hmm. So that certainly helps. So once you set that target, the number that we see is if you run your business to the correct level of profitability, 
after and you've already taken a wage for the serv- for your job as a as a worker in the business whatever role you take then the minimum return on invested capital in our mind is 50% return without selling the business this is year over year mm-hmm. and the average is 75 to 100 for most service based businesses so you should be you should be making a profit equal to half your somewhere between 50 and 100% of your invested capital Exactly. Okay. Huh. And then I found that this is actually an easier way to win the argument of why you should have profitability mm-hmm. is because I have an investment and I need to be at the rate of market for that investment. But and, and I need to leave money in the business to meet that minimum capital standard. Now, the moment I have a dime more than that, I'm free to take it out. I don't right. need to leave it in the business, but it is actually, I believe, actively working in the business up to that point. Hmm. And and so at that point, yes, you're going to have two months of operating expenses in cash. That's kind of one of our core principles. That's part of your capital structure. And but once you you know, I don't want you to have three and I don't want you to have six <laughs> and I want you to have two. And every every dollar above that, too, is is I want it doing something else outside of the business unless you've got some other purpose to, to leave it in, which are limited. So from that standpoint, the argument that I, I try to win in people's mind is, listen, would you starve – if you had a 50 percent CD from the bank, wouldn't you reinvest the after-tax interest every year? I mean, mm-hmm. i got to take the tax out because yep. it is ordinary taxable income. And would you not be thrilled that you have a 50 percent CD, that you're paying tax? on the interest from that CD. Right. Of right. course, you'd be turning backflips telling all your friends, hey, this bank over here is, is giving out – and oh, by the way, sometimes they give out 100% CDs. And so as long as they're giving out that level, I'm going to keep reinvesting. Now, the moment that you know it's time to reinvest and the bank comes back and says, well – I know you'd like to reinvest the proceeds. We don't have any more 100% CDs to give out. How would you like 3%? Then you take the money out and you take it home. That's right. And and so the idea is you always want to invest because this is how private enterprise makes money and builds wealth is I take an, an advantage of that opportunity to make that 50 to 100% return as long as the market allows me to do it. You can't take all the money out. You have to you – have to- before you take distributions, you have to reinvest in the business. That's right. Yeah. And 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 why wouldn't you if it's going to get you a fifty to one hundred percent return? Mm-hmm. Cool. That that's the argument. And so and and like I said, we've done this study on hundreds and hundreds of businesses since we kind of discovered that concept of the why behind it. Yeah. And I have yet to see a U.S. based business that couldn't meet the, the at least the fifty percent return on invested capital standard. Now they may not be doing it because they're unwilling to do the things that they need to do, but there there is a clear <laughs> way that you're not managing your inventory correctly. You're not managing. If you're not getting paid for at least half of the the bills that are in progress or outstanding, then you're doing something really badly wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so it's just it's just courage. It's you got to step up to the plate and build your business case for why that needs to be. And uh, but once you do it, it is freedom of capitalization. So now then, there's an idea that as you improve, you set that level of targeted of profitability, and then. Once you have kind of maximized your share of that market and that bank's not giving out 100% CDs anymore, guess what? There, you can change your where equation. Mm-hmm. So it's not share, it's where. And, and so like what we did, I mean, our, our office is based in Huntsville, Alabama. We we really don't even market to businesses in Huntsville, Alabama, mm-hmm. you know, because it's the old you adage. expand your market at that point. That's right. 85% of what we do is not in Huntsville. So we mm-hmm. you know, we, we changed our where because I couldn't run the practice that I'm running today at the size we're at if I just focused on one geography. Right. And and so now there's other businesses that it makes perfectly good sense if that's what you want to do. Just understand there's a point that you've, you've attracted all the – worth getting business that's going to be in that market share by changing ours to the we can do work anywhere uh i mean i'll, I'll never <laughs> I'll, I'll never get to the share uh equation on that because it's there's businesses all over the world that we work with well we need to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors and when we come back we're going to talk about the final two keys to profitability and hopefully we'll have time to dive into a couple of follow-ups on that too so we'll be right back Smokeball practice management software exists to streamline small law firms and reduce the stress of running a small business. With Smokeball, your firm is much more organized, productive, and profitable, meaning you and your staff can breathe easy with less stress. Visit smokeball.com lawyers today to learn more and book a demo. 
Like what you see? Lawyerist podcast listeners are eligible for 50% off onboarding. With Smokeball at your firm, it's less stress and more success. If you're not 100% happy with your law practice right now, chances are you want more. More income from your practice, more fulfillment from your work, and more freedom to enjoy your life. There's a new law business model that is allowing passionate attorneys to reclaim their lives and love practicing law again. Alexis Neely has been training lawyers for over a decade on the new law business model she created to build her own million dollar law practice. And now, the lawyers she has trained in that new law business model have their own high six and seven figure law practices, all without sacrificing time with their families and only working with clients they love to serve. It is possible to experience the exhilaration of a thriving law practice, do the most meaningful legal work, have a real impact in your clients' lives, and have complete control over your schedule. Discover this new law business model now by watching the free video workshop series at newlawbusinessmodel.com slash lawyerist. Did you know that attorneys who accept online payments get paid 39% faster on average than those who use traditional payment methods? With LawPay, the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program, you can easily accept client payments online, via email, or in person. No equipment needed. Visit lawpay.com slash lawyerist to sign up and get your first three months free. Trust the only payment solution developed for attorneys and recommended by 48 state bars. Law pay. So we're back. So we covered the first key, uh, which is owner's salary and being, you know, uncovering any other hidden expenses like rent that you ought to be paying so that you have a clear picture of your business. Um, the second is what your profitability target needs to be. Um, in the book, you've shown it as 10%, uh, which is actually more like the new break even. And you've previewed that your next book, you're going to be talking about it as as more like 50 to 75, 100% of your invested capital is a reasonable profit estimate. So let's cover the, the two final keys and then dive into some deeper questions. Well, the third key is how. And the number one way that you get to that level of profitability is management of labor productivity. So we believe that labor is the key of changing that equation if you're not currently there. And if you are there, it is how well you manage labor going forward and not giving away the farm, you know, that will allow you to maintain it. And the way that we do that is a little slide of math change of where we look at margin output per labor dollar. Uh, and, and so that's that's really kind of the key. It's not revenue. Uh, however, typically in a professional services business, uh, it will likely be revenue. But here's an example of where it would not be. So if I have an engagement where I have to subcontract a technical piece that I presently don't have the skill set for or capacity, it could be either one, and I subcontract, let's say it's a $10,000 engagement, and I subcontract $2,000 of it to another contractor, and I spend $2,000 of my labor cost on that client relationship. You know, I've billed 10000 If I take 10000 relative to the two, I've got a, a five multiplier of my labor cost. So we call that a labor efficiency ratio. I could look at it as a percentage, but I always ask people, I says, would you rather be referred to as a fraction of something or would you be referred to as a multiplier? And I believe the emotional aspect of being a multiplier, that whatever my labor cost is, I'm creating a multiple off of that for the business in that process. Now, the thing is, 10,000 is a, is a fake number, though, because that's total billings. But I had to give up $2,000 that, you know, to an outside agency. So really, revenue minus uh, materials or subcontractors is what we call gross margin. And we believe gross margin is the true top line of a business. If you look in the original book on page 22, I show an example of a construction company compared to a services business. And the construction company has $20 million of revenue. Services business has $3,750,000. And yet, when you take out their materials and subcontractors, they both get the gross margin of two million seven fifty, and and they're really exactly the same business from that point down. And that's really financial truth speaking. There is you've got to filter out the passers. Now the challenge is is the accounting systems don't line up with our philosophy because they they want to like QuickBooks will give you a, an item called gross profit. And so the next thing we do is we take gross margin minus direct labor to get to a term we call contribution margin. And the reason why separating out direct labor from those other costs, even though I get it and I agree that they are direct cost, here's my argument. 
Labor is the only cost that comes to work every day with an attitude. Its output potential varies from day to day relative to emotion and, and environment and all kinds of things. And so therefore, I must find a way to communicate to that labor more frequently to keep it on track and keep it performing at its best possible version of itself. And, and so as you, as you go through that process, our, uh, we have one prime directive, never, ever, ever mix labor with something that's not labor when it comes to your financials. Mm-hmm. And, and so that gives you clarity. Now, we take labor and put it into two buckets. There's direct labor, the people who, who generally do the stuff that you do, so any of your billable people. And then management labor are the people who do supporting work. Now, we sometimes call it admin labor. I, I just kind of generally call it management labor uh, because higher-level executives feel smirched if I call them admin. And so I'd rather just call all of them management labor. So anybody who's not primarily a, a direct billable source. Now, the thing is, here's your problem. There's some people who do a little of both. Well, great. I always say, if whatever, kind of use the 50-50 you know, scenario. If 50% or more of your time is, is directly facing the customer doing the thing that you do, I want that whole body put up into direct labor. Even though in, in the legal industry, accounting industry, both, we can fractionalize and move those people around, you're giving people ways to kind of slide through the system and find that bucket to charge time to that's not really holding them accountable. So we call it a butt in a bucket. I mean, if you're either direct labor or you're management labor. And if I'm management labor and I do some billing, that's fine. I'm just helping support the, the direct labor team by billing some things. But my prime directive is management of the business. Now, in my case, I'm actually direct labor in our business model. And, and the reason for that is roughly half of my time, I'm working on something client related. It may not be billable, but it is directing the billable activities. It might be directly facing the client. And then the other half of my time roughly is marketing. You know, the, I, I may carry the CEO title, but I'll tell everybody at, at this stage, listen, uh, that's probably 5 10% of my time. There's not enough CEO in to do. And so you may want to give yourself that title. But you got to really be functional and look at it and say, how much do you, you know, in, in a, I mean, we're, we're about $5 million of revenue and uh, about 45 people. And, and so, I, you know, there's not a full-time CEO role. There's just not. And if anybody likes to tell themselves, you're actually just going to be an administrative burden on the rest of the team by trying to draw a full-time salary off of that. So, you know, and there'll be a point that it does justify that. And as I've told my team, I said, that that's when I won't have that job because that's not the job I want. Uh, I, I like the job I have, and, and that's really where my highest, best value is. And so, again, the goal is just getting some truth about um, where you need to be on what you ought to be spending on labor. And as your business grows, you shouldn't just be adding people. And if you're watching the productivity go down, you need to address that problem, not just add more and more people. Yeah, and once you establish kind of the gross margin for the salaries, the whole salaries, both billable and non-billable, what that person is making, you you establish really quickly this pattern for your business. Mm-hmm. For our firm, ours is a two. I, I actually look at two numbers first and foremost when I get my data on the first day of the month uh, for our model for our own firm. I look at our rolling 12 revenue. What have we billed in the last 12 months? And I look at our labor direct labor efficiency ratio. And I can tell you that if we're at a two, I guarantee you we'll be above a 10% profit. Mm-hmm. There's not enough mystery to all the other costs. It, it's going to be that number. Well, and you just mentioned rolling revenue. So let's talk about the fourth key, which is cash flow. Give me the preview of that. Yeah, so so cash flow, think of it like this. It, it's probably actually even a little more subtle than that. It's more about utilization of profit. So once I have profitability, what is my rules of utilization of that? So we call it the four forces of cash flow. Because because here's the thing, people get hung up on this, but I must create profit to create sustainable cash flow. I can create temporary cash flow by selling a fixed asset. But I, you know, once I've sold all my fixed assets, I have nothing to sell, so that's not going to create cash flow. And and I might occasionally collect an old receivable. Well, that'll pop cash flow a little bit. Listen, 
if you'll just commit to consistent profitability and consistent collection, whatever your terms are with your customers, whether it's 50% up front for a project or just billable hours as you go, whatever it is, once it establishes and sets in, you're going to have eventually the cash flow and, and profitability catch up and they get to the same train station. They just get there at a different speed. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the same number. And, and, and I really think it's more about what is your strategic utilization of that profitability. And we say the first thing you do is if I've created profit, I've got a taxable consequence I must prepare for. Now, here's where that nasty word taxes comes in. And let me just tell you, unless you write a big stinking check to the IRS, you got a problem. Because there's nothing that's going to eliminate your taxes other than two things. I either didn't make any money or I cheated. And both of those are bad. And, and so just get over it and quit listening to all these stupid stories that people tell you because they're not telling you 100% of the truth. There's nickel and dime crap out there that tax advisors talk about. And, you know, it depends on how big you consider a nickel and dime, I guess. You know, but, I mean, you know, it's a 1000 here and a 1000 there. I, I Listen, I, you know, I'm talking about six-figure impacts. And we've taken people that had mindsets of not paying taxes and, and turned it around to where they're writing seven-figure checks to the IRS because they can show you where the multiplier or that number is in real cash. Right. You, 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 you have to stop thinking about lowering your tax burden and start thinking about increasing yeah. your profitability, which will increase your tax burden. And that's a good thing. That is a good thing. And you say this in the book a few times, but it's like, stop focusing on not paying taxes and just, yeah. there are absolutely smart times to move a payment forward or backwards or, or, you know, add an expense when it makes sense. But um, the goal is not just to minimize your taxes. Realistically, you know, you want to be able to, to write that check. And the key is what most people have gotten messed up is they're not setting aside the amount of tax as it happens because the IRS's schedule of when you pay it in is so disconnected from that. Mm -hmm. And so where we found success in this is quarter, when I'm having a discussion with a client on April 15th, it's not about how much tax you need to pay in for the extension for this year's return. That's been settled a long time ago. Well, we're asking, what did you make in the first quarter and how much tax do we need to set aside that you may not have to pay for a year from now? Right. But, but guess what? It's not your money. And so let's set that aside and just not even, not even worry about it. Because really, be careful the, of the instructions that you give your tax accountant. If you tell your tax accountant that you don't want to pay tax, and that's easy. I'll just help you not make any money. <laughs> <Right. laughs> you know, and I'm going to I'm going to help you waste precious capital that you created from profitability and spend a dollar to save 40 cents in tax. And that is just the dumbest idea that there's ever been created in that process. And and these are just psychological things because I mean people do. I mean they just have this visceral reaction to taxes and I go, "Listen, I mean, you know, we we've got clients that you know, made nothing, paid no tax for 14 years on, they had no profit in the business for 14 years. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, they go, you know, they have that first year, they owe a little bit of tax and they freak out. And I go, listen, we've set the money aside, just pay it. Well, that, that's where I've arrived. Like, I, you know, the taxes were a problem because I wasn't planning appropriately for them. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm planning appropriately for them, I, I don't care if I have to write a check. It's not about that. And uh, I just want to be able to write that check. That's the important thing. Yeah. So the four forces, that's the first step that you do. The second step is then I want you to make sure that you use the net after tax money left in the business that you got left over. I've set aside my taxes and we that's pay it all equation. out to ourselves as distributions, right? Well, if you're a flow through <laughs> business, yeah, yeah. The idea is no, let's not do that. Uh, the advantage, the technique that we actually do is we actually have the business set up a tax savings account for the tax money. And so mm -hmm. That's what quarter done. to quarter or month to month, we put that aside. And then when your accountant tells you it's time to make an estimated payment, that's where you pull the money out from, but you don't count that as part of your business money, right. you know, in that, that process. So, so then you go to the second one, it says, Oh, any cash left over. If I owe anything on a lot of credit, let's, let's pay that in because I, I'm fine with you having a line of credit, but lines of credit are for temporary distortions in the cash flow cycle. Mm -hmm. By nature, if you have a line of credit that does not go to zero for a 30 consecutive days, you have what the bank industry calls an evergreen loan. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and so it's not a lot of credit. It is a lack of profitability or lack of discipline of use of profits. And, and so that, that becomes a critical key. So we want that line of credit to go to zero. Then third, the third force of cash flow is I need to keep cash in the business until I have two months of operating expenses in cash. And so that so you means, don't need the line of credit. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it is it, it, what is really amazing to me is how many of our clients have no debt. Mm-hmm. I mean, none. I mean, they have a lot of credit. It just has zero on it. Mm-hmm. They might touch it once a year, once every two years. I, you know, it's like, well, should I renew it? Yeah, I mean, it's good to renew it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, but but you know, the thing is, it's there for emergency dis- or you know, temporal disruptions in the business. You know that are just you know rare, but yet I don't want to be scrambling trying to put that loan in place when it's time to need it. But but it's really amazing to just the comfort that people get once that line goes to zero and stays there. And then the third piece is once I have the line paid off, and and I and as we said, you have two months of core capital in the business. That's what we call buffer capital now. Mm-hmm. And, and and so once I get to that number, any dollar above that is then the fourth use of that cash flow, and that's a distribution. So really, you got to take care of everything else first. Right. It's the last thing. Distributions is the last thing you take care of. And this feeds back in because if you're thinking about your distributions as the primary way you get paid from your business, then we've just scared the hell out of you. Right. Because it sounds like you're not going to get paid, which is why you have to give yourself a reasonable salary up front so that you can be looking. I mean, the whole point of everything we've been discussing to this point is getting a true financial picture of your company, which you can't do if you're paying yourself off distributions, which is how many solos are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're not, you know, and and you need that consistency, I will tell you, I mean, when you set that salary to a market wage, it is amazing how people will work to a salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, emotionally, you'll defend salary long before you'll defend profitability. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I just, it's humans just, there, there's this field of study called behavioral economics, and I'm a huge fan of that course of study because it's just really powerful to see what actually you know can happen when you change that human behavior matrix of how you see the problem. How should a, a solo or a small firm lawyer get to their market rate salary? Because uh, you've given some examples in your book, and I'm, I'm not sure those all apply to our industry. And I'm, I'm just wondering, how do you start thinking about that? Or what's a reasonable assumption to make and then just go with? Well, I mean, I, I, there are some reasonable, decent surveys out there. I mean, we actually subscribe to the Economic Research Institute's salary assessor program. So I can actually pull, we, we have legal clients that we pull wage surveys uh, for the for the base pay of that position, but but actually there gets to be a component though that you know if you look at a, a lawyer's pay, you know they are a productive element of the practice, and certainly depending on what genre of practice they practice in. I mean, if you're a if you're a personal injury lawyer, then you're probably going to have a lower base, but you're going to get a lot of variable comp because you're winning cases, and but it's going to be a little more lumpy versus someone who does consistent real estate law practice or business law practice. Yours is about a production component. And so what you can do but how is do you, you can actually, well how do you, too how do you split up the I'm also the CEO versus the leader of the litigation team for example Yeah well it, it's one of those things that there is a you know we can the easiest thing is we can pull a wage survey on that and then when you start to look at what that pay is and you start to if you have a multiple role in the business you just apply the percentage to that rate of pay So classic example I use dentist uh, for this one so we have these two dentists that pay themselves on production they have three low locations. And so we're at the end of the year meeting and one of the partners made 750,000 for that year and the other partner made 300 and he was complaining that you know he spent more time managing the business. And he was right, he did. And I said, "Absolutely, we're going to take care of that. We're going to track every hour that you spend managing the business. It will pay you at a rate of $75,000 a year because that's what we can go hire a practice manager." Because here's the thing, he's thinking about all that time he's spending managing the business is CEO, president duties. And they're not. They're managerial duties that are a much lower value. And I said, we'll track all that time, pay you at a rate of 75000 Is Oh, by the way, I would do want to remind you that as a dentist, if you have your hands in somebody's mouth, you know, you can make a low rate of pay of 300 to a high of 750. So 
hey, it's your choice. You can pick any job you want, but the market picks your pay. Right. So what? So the end of the story is we actually hired the practice manager for them, made <laughs> right. seventy five thousand. <laughs> the guy made five hundred thousand the next year instead. Yeah, you may you may want somebody to to hire somebody to run it. Um, one of the concepts you talk about in your book, which I really like, is sort of working backwards from your profitability margin that you're aiming for, your revenue. Um, to get to your salary cap and treating your company like a sports team. Um, maybe you can describe briefly the concept and how to do that, because I really like that. Yeah, because really, if, you know, a lot of times we look at it from a standpoint that if you're not profitable where you're at, you've got one of two choices. You know, can I keep labor costs the same and grow to a point to meet my profit goal? Or do I need to cut labor and how much labor would I need to cut and still get everything done that I'm currently doing? And I might do a blend of the two. And so, so that's typically, you know, your, your issue because let's say I'm paying $600,000 in wages right now and my profitability is zero and, mm -hmm. and I need to, let's say I'm doing a million dollars since this labor is probably the biggest, you know, practice cost. Let's say I'm doing a million dollars in revenue. Then, I probably, if you look at those, everybody wants to cut kitchen supplies, and and I'm telling you, you know, you know, going to one ply toilet paper is not going to make you profitable. <laughs> it's just going to aggravate you. It, it is about labor productivity, and so the idea is, I'm at zero profit at six hundred thousand in labor. You know, the chances of me probably getting to a million one and spending not a dime more in labor or slim, yeah. to be quite honest. So usually you have to go through and say, what what labor do I have that's not productive? Back it up and you, here's my labor cost needs to be this right. in order for me to hit right. this profitability. And so somebody's got to go or somebody's salary has got to get cut or I need more work out of you guys so that we can move the ball on what the revenue is. Yeah. And, and so, you know, so from that standpoint, realistically, I mean, there's your two labor efficiency ratio. I got 600,000 labor. I really need two times that number. And so I need a million two mm -hmm. out of that. So you look at your team and say, can this team get me to a million two? And all of a sudden, now you realize I actually have the right salary cap. I just don't have the right productivity. Yeah. So I got to put some people on waivers and I got to go pick up some free agents. And, oh, I actually might have to draft better and develop talent better. Speaking of uh, speaking of this, uh, you've talked about incentive plans briefly and fairly dismissively in the book. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that's probably right, having tried a lot of different plans for myself. I, I, I don't think the typical employee is really motivated by incentive plans outside of, say, sales. I mean, so I, I kind of fall into the uh, Adam Grant and uh, Dan Pink camp that uh, Dan Pink has a great TED talk on the puzzle of motivation. Mm -hmm. and, and really, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you think that giving somebody the perfect comp plan will motivate them to perform. I mean, you're just fooling yourself that realistically we believe in compensation structure that you're trying to align market-based wage for market-based performance. If I put some variable component in there, if you use any type of variable component at all, we're fans of the great game of business uh, Jack Stack approach where it's a bonus per, as a percentage of base pay and we have some structures that we've adapted from their philosophy that work really well you know, with our, our planning platform, because then it is about you know you're you're sh you're moving up the market wage scale from let's say if I set somebody's salary at the 50th percentile of market, how I get to the 75th percentile of market is because as a team we all functioned correctly together, right. and I moved up. But I've, it's never where you really where people err just incredibly often in incentive comp is you try to give them a you know, every time you do this, you get this. Well, the problem with that is that rate of giving somebody, in essence, an annuity of an activity is margin that you're going to need back at some point. And it might work for a little while, right. but it, it's really painful when I grab that back. When I actually set a performance target as a percentage of base pay, I, I can model out that as the company hits its targets, and, and we're not even using the, the target that we look at is that contribution margin number, not even net income, because I don't want... 
I'm not a fan of the team being involved in the strategic decisions where an owner decides to spend costs this year, but the benefit will come in a year to come. Right. Because then I'm restricting myself, I'm giving sway to the bonus program and not investing in my business and not making a, a discretionary choice of the use of profit for growth. And and if you base it off of that, that middle number of contribution margin that we talk about, that's a safer number where everybody can have uh, a benefit from. And, and it can be modeled out so that I know that of what I gave out in gain share, I still gain too as the owner. So rather than incentives, it's better to focus on motivating your employees, getting the right people in the door, keeping them around so that you're not having to deal with turnover and training and um, and all that stuff. And I don't want to get into culture because we've talked about it plenty on the podcast, but the short version is like Dan Pink's TED Talk is a, and, and the, the facts and data that underlie it is one of the main reasons that companies are more focused on culture than on in incentive plans. Yeah, but there, and certainly there's a, is an advantage to do a reinforcement of, hey, here's, here's success, but it's not a number mm -hmm. that is so large that it becomes, it changes how a person acts. It's almost like I, I want them to do their best no matter what. Right. And when I actually create an incentive program that that changes their behavior, what happens when the market is working against you and that, that performance isn't there? Well, and it, I mean, it also it, creates the situation with my daughter where, um, you, you know, that I have with my kids where I'm like, if you decide to do this thing, then here will be the consequence. And then it lets her decide, yeah, I'm comfortable with that. And maybe your employees are comfortable not making their incentives. <laughs> and, and yeah, it, it's just really kind of one of those things that I think the, the one plan that we do help a lot of clients implement is the great game of business version. Because they've had, it is really kind of one of those that kind of matches up nicely if you did want to do it. But I, I would say that maybe 20% of our clients do some type of incentive plan. I'm really more of a fan of, so my, my simple take on compensation is this. Uh, number one, forever take cost of living out of your vocabulary when it comes to compensation. Mm -hmm. your, your cost of living makes is no difference to me, you know, what I should pay you. What I should pay you is market. Mm -hmm. Because if I paid you, if I paid everybody based on cost of living, I would pay everybody the same wage regardless right. of task or skill set. Right. That, that makes no sense whatsoever. And so at the end of the day, I'm trying to pay you market-based wage because then morally I can demand market-based performance. So that establishes the moral high ground for both parties. And, and so then when you start moving forward from there, the way I describe it is this. Use a bonus to recognize someone for exceptional performance above expectation that is unsustainable, and and the, and the key is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. How many of us have given people raises for unsustainable performance? Right. And 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 I get it, but you use a raise for two things. The market has now shifted, and I'm telling you, the data that I'm tracking is wages are increasing somewhere between five and eight percent a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we, this goes back about we've been tracking this since uh, about six years ago in our own data. So five percent annual raises should probably just be an assumption that you include in your planning. Pretty pretty much. If if they're if they're an employee that you'd like to keep, that's pretty much where it has to be because that that's what our weight because we track it. We've got a weight scale for every position, and so I track four key positions that are static. So I'm not following a person because that person is going to move up up levels. But I'm just tracking the same position, uh, these four, le four particular positions for us mm -hmm. for the last eight years, and the lowest year of increase has been 5%, and the highest year has been 8 hmm. Yeah, and, and, and which means if my labor cost is going up, I better darn well be increasing, increasing my prices, too. Uh, lastly, let's, let's tackle this one concept of uh, opening up the books. How, how do you feel, once you've gotten some honest finances uh, on the books, how do you feel about sharing that with your employee as if they're part of the team? So we've had good success in a, uh, I, I kind of more recommend the limited scale. Now we're brutally open book. I wouldn't recommend that to everybody, okay. but you know, we, we spend a lot of time teaching all of our staff, the understanding of the data, not just how to read it. Um, but here, here's my, here's my rules for open book management. Number one, the owner must be able to defend the data. You, you can't, advocate that to me. I can coach up the owner or my, my one of my consultants can coach them up, teach them how to talk about it, but they've got to own it. And and if they can't defend the data, you're going to look bad in front of your team. Right. So if you, if you just don't feel comfortable doing that, 
I probably wouldn't. I might only do it on a most severely limited basis uh, and, and be careful of that. Secondly, is you can't have no inconsistencies in the data. You can't have any protected species on payroll, uh, which includes spouses, children, uh, your your lazy gotcha. roommate from college that you're helping out. You know, there's some great grids and personnel that talks about. Um, uh, we, we call them the. Um, uh, what terms call them the terrorists? So that's a person that's low on culture and high on output. Hmm. Uh, you know, you don't want the, the, those are really kind of problematic. You don't want the person that that is high on culture and low on productivity, and they're being paid a number. We, we had this happen. I refer to this in the book in, in one of the chapters where I said, but this lovely person, you know, she's great culturally. Uh, she had her resume said 15 years of experience. And come to find out, she had one year of experience 15 times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and because she was such a nice person, the person that she worked for covered for her all of those years. Sure. She had pretty much the same manager for those first 15 years. And when the manager left that firm, that's what exposed her at the other firm. Right. And then she, when she came to us, here I've got a person who I'm paying a 15 years of experience worth market wage to, and I got one year accountants out of college running circles around her. Right. And 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 it's like if if I don't adjust her pay, and there was I actually could not cut her pay enough to make it work, and her and her still stay. So you've got to be able to be comfortable with all your numbers, including you can't have little sort of the kinds of things you might do when you own a business where you're like, no, it's fine, we'll just treat you like an employee. You, you've got to you've got to be comfortable showing the books to your employee, and it can't just be like because I'm the owner, that's why. That's right. And, and, and you've got to have a value equation because if I'm going to open that up, you know, everybody's really going to start to question that. Mm -hmm. Now, I will, I will tell you, even if you don't open it up, they have an idea. And, they, <laughs> and, and you should probably and, get rid of those things anyway because it's a sign of a, of a goof. Yeah. Your business shouldn't be tricky. And, and I will tell you that I would rather show them the truth and defend it mm -hmm. because what they don't know or guessing at is far worse than showing them the truth. That's a good point. Um, but also, if you can't defend it, why are you, you know, why are you doing it? You may, maybe somebody needs to shine a light on this for you. Yep. Anything else we should do before opening the books? So there is a technique that I would say most of our clients do, and that is that sharing of revenue, direct cost, direct labor down to contribution margin. We think that's we think every business actually can share down to that point. So once we teach them these concepts of talking about labor efficiency ratios and sharing that data, we think that's a very safe number to share down to. And you got to remind them, hey, that's not profit. There's there's still operating expenses and mm -hmm. and stuff that we got to pay for that. But that becomes we think contribution margin dollars is the most critical number in your P&L because it, it is the pure output of your business engine. So I've, I've already filtered out my labor and I've filtered out any pass-through costs from contractors. And so now this is, this is really what I got to cover overhead, pay management labor and make a profit. Very cool. Greg, thanks so much for being with us today. I think uh, we're running up against our time, and I really appreciate your patience and, and walking us through this stuff. We'll, of course, include a link to your book in our show notes. And if you want to follow along or catch up on Book Club this month, just pick up the book and join us in our Facebook Insiders group. Greg, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced with help from Lindsay Calhoun and edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. Oh,